theyeshiva.net. I think it's important, number one, when we talk about this issue of Shaduchim and navigating the waters of Shaduchim and trying to cross our own Red Sea and trying to part our sea. And sometimes the challenges are difficult. I think there are a few premises that perhaps can be helpful and meaningful to some of us. And that is, number one, it's extremely important to remember that it's really, really unfair to ourselves when we buy into the idea that before we're married, it's like life doesn't count. Let's be frank about it. We live in a society where family is so intrinsic, so essential. The trajectory of life is see, you know, you're born, you grow up, and one day, Be'ezer Hashem, you start your own family. And we all hope for that, but we have to remember also that all of life is a journey. And the journey of life is not something anybody can fully comprehend and understand. Nobody knows why they're born and why am I born at this specific time? And why am I born in this home and in this family and in this community? And why do I, why do I experience these challenges? And what's exactly the shlichus and the mission of my life? So much of life is a mystery that transcends us. So it's very important never to define our lives in a particular form put it in a box, and if it doesn't fit into this box, it becomes worthless. A much healthier and more authentic way of living is with a sense of openness and gratitude. Gratitude for the fact that I am right now a channel for the divine energy that is flowing through me. Gratitude for the fact that I am here right now having the ability to be able to express and manifest and embody divine consciousness, divine love through me. That is ultimately what the meaning of life is right now, right here. Do I want to try to attain my goals? Of course. Do I want to be blessed with all of the things that we know are blessings and very special? Of course. But I never, you never want to get so stuck in a certain paradigm of what life is supposed to look like. And if it's not looking like that, everything is miserable. Everything is a curse. It's just not fair to us. It's also not fair to the people around us. It's also not fair to our creator. And what I mean by that is, yes, there may be disappointments and there is pain. And it's very, very important to empathize with yourself and to empathize with others, to have compassion and to be able to identify in a very honest and authentic way what you're experiencing. But it's also equally important to be able to tell ourselves, my life did not stop. You don't put life on pause just because I'm not engaged or I'm not married. I didn't yet build a family or this date didn't work out. It's a challenge. It's part of my journey. But it doesn't mean my life is worthless. Chas v'shalom. So you say, yeah, but look at my sister and my niece and my sister's marrying off her 11th child. And, and I went last night to the wedding of, you know, <laughs> my sister's, whatever it is, everyone has all different experiences. And there are tears and there's grief and there is sadness. And I may have to grieve, grieve for a life that I imagined and planned for a trajectory that I foresaw. And it didn't work out that way. Things happen in a different way. But I don't want to remain in a place of brokenness and despair and hopelessness and just say, you know, my life is a curse. Chas v'shalom. To look at your life that way. Every soul has a journey. Every soul has a mission. And every moment of life is indispensable to your mission. Every one of us constitutes an indispensable note in the cosmic divine symphony. Every single moment of our lives is a miracle. Like the Baal Shem Tov says, creation happens every single moment anew. And what is really life? Life is really the breath that I inhale and that I exhale. Koil HaNeshama, Tahalaliyah, Hallelujah. So the Medrash says, Koil HaNeshama, Kol Neshima Neshima. Every breath that I inhale and I exhale is another opportunity for gratitude. Nothing in life can be taken for granted. 
Do I have to be here? Did I create myself? Did I create the 70 trillion cells that make up my living organism? Did I create the nine systems that make my biology tick and function? Did I create my 100 billion neurons? Did I create my white blood cells, my red blood cells, my digestive system, my, re my digestive system, my respiratory system, my urinary system, my circulatory system? I mean, each one is a grand miracle of titanic, gigantic proportions, unfathomable to the human brain. And that's only my own life. Never mind every life that I'm connected to because I can't live on my own. I have to inhale oxygen. I need to eat vegetables. I need to eat fruits. I need to eat whatever I'm eating. We're all dependent on each other. We're dependent on our planet. We're dependent on our universe. So no moment is taken for granted ever. No moment makes sense. The whole hisavos yesh and the whole existence is one grand miracle. So what does it mean really to live? To live means to be aware and consciously in tuned with the truth that right now the breath that I am taking in and I am exhaling, I am giving out, is essentially an opportunity for gratitude, the gratitude of being a channel for Hashem's creative power of life that He chose me to manifest His infinite light through me right now at this moment, through my thoughts, my words, my actions, my love, my gestures, my connection, my attachment, my faith, and my living right now at this moment. This we must never, ever go away from. You don't want to go out of that space because when you're anchored in that truth that your life right now is of ultimate value and significance, and the significance is that you and I, each in our own way, could be a channel, a shoifer for Hashem's light, that anchors us in an indestructible space of love and light and serenity from which we can navigate the journeys, the challenges, the turbulence, the struggles, the disappointments from a much more anchored and powerful and healthy and confident and empowered space. I want to be able to experience all my emotions, to experience all my thoughts, but I don't want to identify with every negative and toxic thought to the point that I become that thought, I become a victim of that fear, of that uncertainty, and there's nothing left of me. I think it's also important not to repress things. It's important to be able to feel the pain that we have. It's important to be able to identify because if we repress it, it comes back to haunt us. It comes back to bite us. The proper path of Amuna faith is knowing that every moment I am in the hands of my Creator who's embracing me like a beloved child, like the Baal Shem Tov says, Hashem loves every Jew more than a parent loves an only child who was born when they were older and they didn't think they'll have a child. And even that love doesn't capture the infinite love that Hashem has to you, Hashem has to me right now at this moment. But part of that journey can include traveling to places that are difficult, dealing with a past that may be difficult, dealing with challenges that happened yesterday or last week that may be difficult. And I want to be able to look at them with compassion, with understanding, with sensitivity, with love, but to look at them when I'm anchored in my own indestructible self, which could never be tarnished, could never be scathed, could never be destroyed. The foundational idea of Tanya, that every single one of us has, a, is a, has and is a chelik aleikam imal mamash, we are a fragment of divinity, a derivative of infinite consciousness, an embodiment of divine light. And therefore, at every single moment, we are anchored in a space of absolute clarity, of absolute love, of absolute light. That, when we can take it seriously, internalize it viscerally, and make our soul, our nefesh kiss, our neshama, our best friend, it changes everything. Because if your soul is your best friend, then ultimately, you don't need to look for validation from other people to be able to tell you, oh, you're good, <laughs> you have value, we think you have chashivas, you have significance. Your soul gives you your value. Your divinity gives you your value. And now when I'm etched in that place, I can navigate the journeys of my life and the challenges of my life with so much more clarity, with so much more confidence, with so much more resilience and resolve and courage and never allow disappointments or pain to derail me and throw me off my tracks and really overwhelm me to a point where I don't know if I'm coming or I'm going. So I just made two major points in summation. Number one, never ever define 
the success of your life in terms of other people, copying other people. Yes, our community focuses on family. Yes, we cherish having children and we cherish a life of marriage and we wish everyone and all the good things. And may all those blessings and prayers be fulfilled for each and every one. But the journeys of life are very, very, very mysterious. And we have to respect them with awe, with reverence. And that includes your own journey. Don't look at yourself and say, I've dated for so many years. Nobody wants me. I'm just one big failure. Those words are not coming from your soul. Those words are coming from a very, very external, traumatized, victimized place in myself. I want to rather rephrase it and say, yeah, this has been a difficult journey, a challenging journey. But you know what? Every day that wasn't, doesn't work out is an opportunity for me to grow. It's an opportunity for me to ask myself deeper questions, to uncover a deeper layer of self. Every day that goes by is an opportunity for me to find out more about who I am, to flex my spiritual, psychological, emotional, physical muscles. Every obstacle is an opportunity, and every opportunity is a challenge, and every challenge, every, every obstacle is a challenge, and every challenge is an opportunity, and every opportunity is an invitation. It doesn't mean it's always easy, but nobody understands the secret of your shlichus, and don't reduce it to a box created by other people or even by your own mind. Be open to the excitement of the mystery of the infinite journey of life, the journey of a chelik elekami mal mamish that comes down from the highest infinite places to a very dark world in order to be able to discover its own true light and to, in order to be able to illuminate the darkness in our world, each of us in our own way. And it begins inside ourselves. We all have infinite light that confronts very powerful darkness and toxicity. So yeah, I, so I think, you know, I, I, I hope this is not coming across as just, you know, abstract, nice philosophical advice. But I think it's very, very important when we could really tune into that space. Sometimes, you know, when life works out the way it may be worked out for some of our siblings or nephews or nieces or cousins or parents or other people, friends, classmates, sometimes we're not challenged to discover who we are. Precisely those people who went through real challenges, and maybe people who are listening right now or watching right now, or will be listening or watching, and only heaven knows how much you have been through. If it's not enough, everything you've been through through childhood, there's things that happened when you were a teen. And if that wasn't enough, there were other challenges you faced and adversity you had to confront so much more painful than many other people you know. And now you thought you'll finally find the right guy, build a home, it won't take long, it won't be too hard, and you'll experience bliss. And what are you facing? Disappointment and heartache and heartbreak and rejection and another disappointed. So I wanna to speak to you from the depth of my heart, hopefully to the depth of your heart. And that is, those of us faced with serious challenges in life can't afford to live superficially. It doesn't work for us. Too many bumps, too many ditches, too many obstacles. We have to go much, much deeper. And you know what? In many ways, that is a blessing. It's the blessing of discovering levels of self and layers of truth that other people don't have to discover. You'll say, oh, thank you, Rabbi Woiwei. I don't need these blessings. I would rather have a simple, simple life. I get it. I get it. I know so. <laughs> but nobody asked me. Nobody, nobody asked you. The story of an Ashama is very, very profound. It's very mysterious. It's rooted in very deep, deep places. And we have to respect the fact that we didn't create ourselves. We have the opportunity to be a channel for infinite bliss and love. And that's a great privilege. It also comes with a great responsibility. It also comes with pain. It's painful to show up. And it's painful to know deeper things. And it's painful to have to go deep into our souls. But I still say, it's the blessing of knowing who you really are. The fact that so many of you cannot just be blissful in the way that other people, the truth is, everyone today is struggling. That's true. Today, people are struggling very deeply. 
it's not now the time to discuss, but I'm talking about the particular demographic and group that is gathered here this evening. The fact that things are not coming so easy for you. I have no, I don't know why. I don't know why. And everyone should have all the bliss they want and deserve as fast as possible in the easiest fashion. But take every challenge and understand that it's allowing you to get to excavate the deepest parts of your personality, of your psyche, and live life to the fullest, even if the plan is very different than you imagined it to be two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Being mature in life and being spiritually connected means living with a duality, which is really not a duality. On one hand, we have goals. We all want to be successful. We want to be comfortable. We want to have a good life. We want to have a geschmacker life. We want to have an enjoyable life. We want to have all the blessings. Together with that, it's also living with the humility and the awe and the openness and the reverence of understanding that we will never, ever know the full depth of our journey. And I want to be open to my mission and to the miracle right now at this moment. And when we have this approach, I think our entire attitude to dating and to relationships comes from a much, much more empowered place rather than from a place of desperation. A few practical pieces of advice that I think might be helpful. I don't think, and I'm going to try to say this in a very sensitive way, but you'll, I think you'll understand my point. You don't want to go out on a date in order to feel that you're validated, in order to feel that you have value, in order that you feel that you're loved. You know why? Because if it doesn't work out the way you wanted it to work out or the way you hoped it to work out, what happens to the love? What happens to the validation? You need to have internal love. You need to have self-love. You need to have self-validation. You need to have self-compassion. And you need a support system for that because we're all part of a unit. We all need other people. You're going out to find out if you love him. (laughs) That's what you're going out. You're not going out to find that if you're loved. That's not the reason why you're dating. Very important. Then the heartbreak won't be so profound. Because even if he says no, she says no, whatever the situation is, you didn't go out to find out if you're loved. You're loved. You're loved. It's absolute. You need to give that to yourself. You went out to find out if you love him, if you like him. If he, or if it's a case of the boy, I would tell him if, if you like her, if you love her, if you really want to build a home together, if you want to bond and unite your two journeys together and have This is a very, very um, important point. Another important point. The more you feel better about yourself, the more you're in a place where you can be attracted and where you can experience the beauty of another person. The other person can't be here in order to heal my stuff, to make me feel that I have value. I really have to work on myself. And by the way, this is true for everyone, for singles and for married people. And when people get married, trust me, this is a very serious issue because so many of the challenges I see in marriage, and I see it constantly, and I think we all see it, is that very often people who have not faced their own wounds, their own unresolved scars, so easily project and blame their spouse for those issues. And they don't even know it. They're not doing it consciously and deliberately and maliciously. It's just a defense mechanism. My brain has become conditioned to protect me from any type of relationship and interaction that might threaten parts that have been exiled and hidden away for many, many years. And nothing triggers people in such a deep way like a close, intimate relationship. So very often when we get into a deep relationship, Those relationships trigger our deepest wounds. People I meet in show or classmates that I meet at a reunion or people I meet in the street, they're not going to trigger those levels of self. And therefore, those relationships are pretty easy. They're called acquaintances. But it's precisely the more profound relationships that will also trigger 
the deepest wounds, those relationships that will begin to replicate or touch on the nature of your self-esteem, your relationship with your mother, your relationship with your father, your with your brothers, with your sisters, your relationship with yourself. Those relationships that are precisely destined to go to a much deeper place will trigger you in a much deeper place. And that's when we have to be very, very courageous and ask ourselves tough questions. Is this about him or is this about me? Is this about her or is this about me? Maybe it's both. And I have to be able to get that guidance and mentorship and have that support system to be able to address it because very often in life, people remain blinded and it's sad. They are in active trauma, but they don't see it. And therefore, they always blame the other person because nobody ever helped them confront their own demons and skeletons, which are very deep. And you know what? When somebody is triggering you very badly, very heavily, it's a tremendous opportunity to stand back with curiosity and ask, what just happened? Why did I become so overwhelmed? What just freaked me out? Why do I want to break the window? Why do I want to run away? Why do I want to fight? flight, fawn, or freeze. Why? What just happened? That introspection might create a tremendous, tremendous amount of growth. I want to say something else that I think can be helpful in this whole parsha, And that is Everyone deserves to have a support system. We cannot live lives on our own. We weren't designed that way. We were designed to be connected. We were designed to be attached to each other, to give and to take. Rebbe would always say that Hashem made everything in this world to have a dual role. It's a mashpia and a makabal. Everything, every creature, from a tiny little insect, reptile, bird, fish, bush, shrub, tree, mammal. Every atom, every cell, everyone gives, everyone contributes something. That little bee that I see flying around is contributing to our planet. It's pollinating plants that can grow. Yes, it's going to receive nectar. It takes and it gives. That's true even about a little annoying bee that I don't like. I actually am in awe of bees because I know a little bit. I've, I'm fascinated with these little type, little creatures. I see the amazing element of it. I don't like a bee bite, of course, but I'm very careful. The Atamachaya is kulam. The Gemara says Hashem sustains the most wild, powerful oxen and the eggs of lice. Karnei re'emim at kene bitzgat ki at beitze kinem. Everyone is part of that purpose. You think you're not? I'm not. Every one of us is a mashpia. Every one of us is a makabal. Every one of us. And the moment we take ourselves out, we extricate ourselves from that cycle, we're not fully alive. We are always constantly in a space where we receive and where we give mashpia, makabal. And that's what it means to be alive. It means to be synchronize yourself with the rhythm of life. Mashpia, makabal. When I find myself going into wallowing in a place of hopelessness and despair, and I'm just looking for people to validate me, somehow I'm not in touch with myself. You always have to tell your mind to follow your soul rather than the soul following the mind. And this is not about forcing. I can't force my mind, but yes, I can tell my mind, come back with another script. Or I could tell my mind, I'm going to deal with you later. Or I could tell my mind, I understand what you're going through and I'm sorry. But you cannot dictate my entire life. And it's important to spend time every day tuning into that space of love and light and infinite connection. And here we come to the point we give and we take. And I think in this area, and from a very practical point of view, I think it's important for every person to create around them a support system, maybe five people, 10 people, 20 people, 30 people, close family members, distant family members, people you trust, people you like, people you know care for you. Be uncles and aunts and nephews and nieces and cousins and siblings and siblings' children and classmates or acquaintances, friends, and let them all be part of your team, part of your fan club, if I may say, because then you have 30 people looking out for you. 
And you never know what happens, but I think it's very, very important. Everybody, don't be embarrassed. Every one of us needs to turn to these people and say, listen, I want you to be part of my support system. People will be honored. People will be wonderful. And you never know how things happen. You know, sometimes we deal with everything on our own. It's not fair to you. You can't deal with everything on your own. You may not have certain people that you would like to help you. Maybe people are very close to you, but for whatever reason, it's not working out in the relationship or trust, or they don't know who you are. They don't know what you want. Fine. So create your own team, but create team Chaya, team Dvaira, team Sara, team Rivka, team Rachel, team Leia, team uh, uh, Baruch, team Yankel, <laughs> team Zvulun, team Yisachar, team Shimon, team Reuven, whatever it is. Because Shua Yoyetz, as the Pasuk says, when there's, when there's a lot of people connected to me, we never know. People have ideas. Everyone travels. Everyone has their own WhatsApp groups. Everyone meets people. I'm not talking about squandering your energy and getting advice from every single person on this planet, which will overwhelm you. But I'm talking about people that you appreciate, that appreciate you, respect you, you respect them, and they want the best for you. It's important that we don't fight our battles alone and we don't navigate Kriyas Yamsuf. Alone. Even the first Kriya Samsov, we had Moshe Rabbeinu. <laughs> we had Nachshin Ben Aminadov. We had, it was a, it was a team. It was a team effort. Nachshin jumped. Moshe picked up his hand. All the Jewish people walked through. The water became part of it. Vamaim Lam Chaimin. And of course, the Rebbeinu Shalaylam Hashem, who orchestrated it all. Everybody's Kriya Samsov also needs a team effort. I'm going to conclude my words with something I wrote a while ago, I was speaking to singles and uh, so I did some research and I wrote up a few points that I thought could be helpful when people were asking about dating and how they make decisions. And I just wrote up a few points. I can't say that they're organized and orchestrated in some encyclopedic and very deep professional way. But just a few ideas that I think can be helpful. I told the girls and I said, you know, when you're dating, you want to always remember this. I only want to get married once. Some people get married twice. Some people get married three times. As I said before, nobody knows the journey of a soul. But in my plans, I only want to get married once. It's important. So when I'm deciding about marriage, I want to know that I would like I want to know for myself that this is the person I want to live with till my last breath. It should be Chayim Nitzchim with Mashiach's coming because I want to be married once. Another very important thing. <clears throat> Am I truly, truly, truly relating to the person that I'm dating or maybe to an image of that person? Another important thing. Can I be honest about his flaws? Can I be honest about my own flaws? Do we have healthy boundaries? What do people who are close to him say about him? Do you respect him for real? Is there mutual respect? Can you be open and honest with this person? Do you trust this person? How is communication? How well do you get along? Does being with this person bring out the best in you? If he never changes, do you still want to get married? Is he flexible? Can he compromise? Is he kind? Is he a mensch? What are his goals, values? What is he ready to sacrifice for? Does he know how to say, I'm sorry? I think actually I have this in my internet. Probably this list was given to me by a therapist. I said before I wrote it up, I probably edited it, but I think that I just wanted to correct myself. Anyway, these are just some questions I think could sometimes be very helpful in life. And it's extremely important to know something else. And that is that you know, a girl called me, a young woman called me. She was heartbroken, had a long date. And she thought it was so promising and promising. And finally, this person said no. And now he wasn't even returning her calls and emails and so forth. And she was so, so upset. It was so devastating to her. And I said, what's devastating to you? And I thought she would say just the pain, disappointment. 
She said, what's devastating to me is that I'm in love with him. I'm crazy about him. And I wish I can change his mind. I wish. And just then, I saw a letter that the Rebbe wrote a young woman. Or maybe it was a young man. I don't even know. But it was an answer that came out. And obviously, somebody was dating a long time, and it didn't work out. And I think the person left to another country, and they went with somebody else. This person was heartbroken. And the Rebbe wrote, I think it was to a woman. It was a long letter, but just one point. I still recall. This was a while ago. And the Rebbe wrote to her, you know, instead of being so upset, you should be thankful. <laughs> because in the beginning, you had so many doubts. You were so ambivalent. You felt that his heart wasn't there and his soul wasn't there and he wasn't genuine. But you were doubting yourself and you were writing to me letters. Yes, no, do I believe him? Be so thankful that he is actually showing you his true colors. He's not interested. He was never interested. This is not a genuine relationship. He's involved with somebody else. He's not even giving you the dignity of returning your call. Thank God all your questions were resolved. It was such a powerful idea. Of course, there was pain because she was hoping that this is her husband. She was hoping. But the Rebbe says the pain can be from the fact that this journey is a complicated journey, but let it not be from the fact that he said no to you. Thank God he said no to you. Would you want to marry a person who's not really interested in you? <laughs> Thank God he said no to you because you deserve a person who's crazy about you. You deserve a person who really wants to be with you. So sometimes the no is the greatest Yeshua. It's the greatest salvation. You want they should say no after 10 years of marriage. You want they should say no after three kids. We also have to remember that to all the hardship. We always have to say, you know what? This person wasn't interested. I, ho I would have hoped that they're interested, but if the heartbreak is coming from the fact that this person said no, maybe the greatest salvation, because you only want to marry a person who really, really wants to marry you. I want to conclude with my heartfelt wishes and prayers. Hashem should fulfill all of your heart's desires and should all experience the kikri asyamsuf, the toiv haniri vahanigla, with revealed and manifested goodness and with serenity and tranquility. And ease and all your tefillahs should be makoyim and bekar of mamish and each and every one of you should be able to enjoy a life filled with pleasure and delight and brach and atzlacha adabli day la riches yomim v'shanim tovus and that we should hear only good and happy news from each and every one of you and now amen now we'll go to the questions I see this forty two comments on the chat so I guess I'll read them okay. Lomir again, let's start. Oh, you know what? Let me first do the questions that I received earlier, and then we'll do the other questions. Okay, question number one. I'm currently going out with a girl, and it's going really well. However, I just can't seem to shake off the thought of it possibly not working out and being heartbroken. I'm working on my amuna, but it feels like I'm trapped in the feeling that this is not going to work out. What do I do? What am I supposed to do? That's question number one. Excellent, excellent question. Hmm. So I would say to you, I guess this is a young man. I would say to you as follows. I'm very happy that it's going well. Enjoy, enjoy it, be open to it. And I would say, and I think this is advice for all of us. I know it's hard, but I think when we go out, we have to see it as an opportunity just to try to enjoy the other person. We don't know how it's going to work out. We don't know, but see it as an opportunity to find out about the life of another person. And see that as an objective in and of itself, if I may. So I know we're not dating just to date people from the opposite gender. We don't do that. You're dating for one objective. I understand that. But in order to get to that objective, I think if we can go into the car or however we're dating, walk, whatever it is, with a mindset, you know, every person is a chela kelekami mamish. That means every person has something inspiring about them. 
And this truth is, it's true about every human being. If every human being was carved in the image of Hashem, it means that every person is an imprint of the divine creator. That means there is something inspiring, unique, powerful, fascinating, interesting, curious, and holy about every person in a unique way. Yes, that person in the elevator. That person, while I'm jogging, while you're jogging, you might meet him in the park or her in the park. That person who you're getting a lift with, that person has something absolutely unique, divine, and fascinating about them that no person before or after ever had. And if I don't see it in that person, it's not about them, it's about me. I may be in a bad mood, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, I'm overwhelmed, I'm depleted, I got no patience, I'm simply not open to this. And I think going on a date means it's courageous. I'm opening myself up to the beauty of another person, to the charm, to the depth, to the soul, to the creativity, to the humor, to the love, to the kindness, to the values, to the spirituality, to the priorities, to the neshama, to the heart, to the brain, and to the consciousness of another human being. I would say it's a privilege. It may go for an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. It may develop into an incredible friendship. And you know what? It may even develop into the ultimate, <laughs> the ultimate relationship. Makabapatish, you may hit the jackpot and he or she may be the right person. Gavaldik. But even till that point, can I really open myself up to a powerful, special moment, moments of time? with this human being. We can share, I can listen, I can hear. That's, I think, maybe an approach that if we can work on it, even if we did it many times, but see the journey itself as meaningful. And I would say this, it's a very famous Torah from Rabbi Yitzhak of Barticho, I'm not gonna elaborate now, but the point is, every person we date on our journey, it's not a mistake. The Hashgacha didn't make mistakes. Every person we meet is part of the necessary process to get to the right person, which means every person is the right person. I say, everybody, why, why, give me a break. I dated 29 people. <laughs> They're not. My point is, yes, I know it's hard. I know. I'm not saying this in a dismissive way, like get over yourself. I'm not being callous at all. But I am saying this. Every journey in life is part of our destination. For me to be able to marry the person I'm supposed to marry, I needed to meet the other people. Maybe each one of those people taught me something about myself. Maybe each one of those people taught me something about life. Maybe each one of those people made me and helped me confront things I have to confront. So it's not a mistake. And therefore, I want to embrace the journey with enthusiasm, with gusto. If I'm flying to Eretz or I'm flying to another country, I don't have the luxury of going on a private plane. And even then, it takes work. I have to go to the airport. You know what it's like. I have to pack and get it to go to the taxi to the airport. And then there's security lines. And then there's another security line. And then there's the line at the getting to the gate and the line at the gate. And then there's the flight itself. And then there's going through customs and another taxi. So do I say to myself, until I don't arrive at my hotel or my home in this country where I want to go, I will be a miserable person? No. I want to make the best out of the journey because I can only get to Eretz Yisrael if I'm ready to travel to Eretz Yisrael. <laughs> I don't have the wings of an angel yet. The same is true in life. Our journey is part of our shlichus, and therefore let the journey itself become meaningful. Question number two. The guy is great. Well, good. I'm happy. But I'm just not attracted to him. How can I possibly entertain marrying somebody I'm not physically attracted to? Okay, it's a great, great question. It's important that when we get engaged to somebody, we want to be able to know that we can be attracted to them. This is important. It's a very, very subtle question. If you're feeling mamish disgust, repulsion, you have to be very, very careful. If you're not feeling any attraction whatsoever, I think it's important to continue the date. It's important to see if there are any blockages and fears inside of you. It's important to see if something is really bothering you because usually in most cases, if you really love the personality, if I really, really like a person, I'm happy to spend time with them. So then we can be together in all ways required from a husband and a wife. So I really have to ask myself, I maybe have to get closer. Maybe it's important for you to open up to each other a little more. You know, very often when people become vulnerable with each other, 
and they open up about their deeper parts, there is a sense of, of uh, warmth and a deeper connection that can develop. So maybe that's important. So yes, I think it's important not to get engaged just intellectually. It makes sense. You want to be excited. You want to be attracted. It doesn't mean you have to be going with sugar and ecstatic. You know, we don't have a thermometer <laughs> how to measure these things, but it means you're excited. You're inspired. There's enthusiasm and there's a sense of attraction. Really? You want to be with this person for the next 70, 80, 90, 120, 180 years of your life. You want to be with them forever. And if that's not happening, maybe you have to spend more time. Maybe you have to examine if there's blockages. Maybe there are fears. Maybe it's time to get a little more vulnerable with each other. But when you get married, you do not want to do it as a robot because it makes sense on paper. There, there has to be, as the Rebbe called it, Meshich HaSalev. I heard this from my brother, and he heard it from Rabbi Label Groner. Zichroyne Levrocha. Rabbi Yehuda Label Groner told him, I think he told it to him with someone else there, uh, I think uh, Dr. Talushkin, who wrote that famous biography, I think so. And Rabbi Groner said that in 1954, he was dating. He was dating, and he had the question, should he get engaged, should he not get engaged? And he was already working for the Rebbe five years. Five years since 1949, Tov Shintes. So Rebbe Label asked the Rebbe, he's his boss and his Rebbe, <laughs> should he do it? Should he complete the Shidduch? Should he propose? The Rebbe responded as follows. The Rebbe said, you're asking a question that your mother can't answer it for you. Your father can't answer it for you. And I cannot answer it for you. The only one who can answer it for you, and, and your brain also can't answer it for you. The only one who can answer it for you is thine hearts, your heart. Your heart has to give the answer. The Blabel's heart said yes, and he married his wife, his Rebetzin, Zolange Yaren, Rebetzin Yehudas Groner, Lariches Yom and Veshanam Tevis. She should be healthy for many, many happy and prosperous and healthy years with much nachas and blessing. So his heart said yes. That is a very, very powerful piece of advice. I can't help you. Your mother can't. Your father can't. Even your brain. You need your brain. The brain needs to make checklists. The brain got to see the pros and the cons. But ultimately, the heart has to speak. The heart has to speak. Ah, the hearts, the hearts. <laughs> the lave, the lave. Ah. Okay, next question. Nice questions. I have two brothers in Shidduchim above me. I can start, but I want to wait. Should I wait for my two brothers? It's a very hard uh, question to answer. Usually, it depends on your age. It depends on the circumstances. It depends where your brothers are holding. Obviously, you know, if you could wait and things are moving with your brothers, Be'ezir Hashem, wonderful. But if you're in a situation where it's really difficult for you to wait, or they're in a situation where there's no progress, so everything is now just in a state of paralysis, so very often what's done is, you speak to your brothers in a very open way. You get permission. You ask forgiveness. You ask mechila. In other words, you want to get their full, full permission that you can do it with belayv shalom. It's very, very important because there is an element of pain here, and you want your brothers to know from you that you respect them, you love them. And very often that itself, their permission helps them get the bracha that they need. So it's a very, very individual question. You may want to discuss this with some people who are close to the family, who love the family whom you trust. Okay, let's go to the next question. Beautiful questions. So many questions, wow, okay. Next question. Okay, thank you for all the compliments and the feedback. You discussed a lot how we can internally change our mindset. What can be said about how our from society can change to be less marriage obsessed? and exclusionary towards singles. We live in a society where if you're not married, you'll feel like a second-class citizen. How do we change our society? Great, great question. And I would say that our society, like 
<laughs> like all of us, needs to grow and needs to be improved and needs to be enhanced. And I believe today we change things by grassroots, through grassroots initiatives and awakenings. You know, the Talmud says, every person has to say, for me, the world is created because every person has something to contribute that nobody else could contribute. And I think our focus has to be not how will I and we change the whole society and transform it. But I think when each and every one of us brings our full light to the world, when each and every one of us heals, when each and every one of us chooses not to be stuck anymore in judgmentalism, in superficiality, in stupidity, in fear, in looking down at others and trying to validate ourselves through shallow, superficial myths. When I and you and all of us decide and choose and get the help we need to live in a real space of healing and recovery and wholeness and authenticity, light dispels darkness. Society is changing. It may be happening on a slow pace, but it's changing. The more and more people who are getting the help they need, the more and more people who are confronting their deep traumas, the more and more people who are sick and tired from being sick and tired, who are telling themselves enough of me living a life in which I'm completely unaware, in which I'm obsessive, in which I'm completely activating my trauma and without any awareness and without any consciousness, the more and more of us who are opening ourselves up to the falsehoods, opening ourselves up to the corruption, opening ourselves up to the pain that we all endured and that we need to confront. And we bring in an energy of truth, of light, of love, of divinity, of authenticity. Trust me, our society heals with each and every such person more and more and more. And very, very soon, we will all be living in an atmosphere where people will look at things with a divine prism. We will look at other people, not, oh, you're married? Oh, you're not married. What's wrong with you? Why aren't you like me? But rather, we'll be able to look at people and embrace the soul and celebrate the soul. We'll be able to look at people and dance to the end of love, dance with the full uninhibitedness of celebrating the gift in every human soul. Maybe I'm sounding a little too... Uh, <laughs> Too dreamy like, maybe. <laughs> My name is Yosef, and Yosef was accused of being a Balachalaimus, but that's what I really believe. Let's not focus on how we change society because we're perfect. Let's focus on finding our deepest truth and healing and radiating it, radiating it to all around us naturally and by osmosis organically. A lot of healing will happen on many levels. Would you post a list of questions you would ask when dating? Well, I posted a few questions that I think are important, but I think also you have to make your own individual list. Dating is an opportunity to learn something about yourself. Every person is a shliach of Hashem to reflect something about you that Hashem wants you to see. After a date, ask yourself, what did I learn today about myself? Very beautiful. How would you respond to someone who is part of the LBGT community, but he's religious? I'm sure that there are other people like-minded who still are very much vying for the right match. But when this occasionally comes up, we might find the other person very closed-minded on the subject. How is this kind of thing supposed to be approached? It's very important to me because it is who I am essentially. I wouldn't bring up the conversation as a need, as an unhealthy need. But I would want to share it with the girl I eventually marry for her to know who I am at my core. I am slightly feminine. That's why I can identify with the LGBT community. Wow. First of all, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your honesty. Thank you very much for your candidness. <sighs> oh, that's intense. Okay, so I'm very, very gratified to learn that you're not in the camp that loves to preach about the fact that uh, people are created a certain way and there's absolutely no opportunity to grow, to develop, to change, which I think in this particular case, politics has completely eclipsed the science and uh, very little, very little research has been done in order to be able to determine what exactly are the impacts of trauma, of nature, of nurture, 
uh, there's still a lot, a lot of work in this particular field. I'm glad to see that you're open to the fact that you don't just put yourself in a box. This is who I am. This is my core. Kan nimtze, kan hoya, and that's it. Saying that, it's extremely important that we don't deceive anybody. And that's why, obviously, you want to get married only if you feel that you'll be able to have relations with the woman you marry, because if not, it's going to be simply unfair to her and unfair to you. And it's a real form of deception. So it's very important to be able to know that you have reached a point in your growth and development that you're capable of having that type of relationship. In terms of sharing the struggle with the woman you're dating, because this is so much a part of your struggle. So yes, you're going to need to find a girl who's extremely open <laughs> and who's extremely um, sensitive and ready to handle this. You don't want to make another person miserable because you're going to be miserable and it's also not the right or moral thing to do. So it's a very, very delicate situation, but you have to understand something. I know a person who struggled with your struggle and he opened up to the young woman and she opened up to him. And you know what she told him, right? Yes, only God's humor. She struggled with some forms of lesbianism, not in a practical way. She was very careful and he was also very careful. But suddenly they discovered that there was something very deep that connected them and it allowed them to have a very, very honest relationship. Now, that may, don't rely on that. That may not happen. But my point is, you need to be able to find the person who's extremely sensitive and extremely open to that type of struggle. And it may be very difficult for her. She may say, I'm not ready to deal with this. You also have to realize this. I would assume, I don't know you, that this struggle is probably challenging you in a very, very deep way and probably is forcing you to become a much deeper, much more sensitive and much more real and authentic person. So this may even be something that a young woman will cherish in you. But again, you have to find the person and you can't talk about it the first date, but at some point you'll want to test the waters and uh, see how far you can go. But it's very important that we live a life with transparency and honesty. And one last thing, which is maybe needless to say, if you want to get married, it has to be with an unwavering commitment that you are committed exclusively to this person. In other words, if you feel that your struggle is so deep and you may fall prey to the homosexual instinct, in real life and go pursue it, that would be very, very unfair to do. So it's very, very important that you make that decision, that you are ready to commit to a life with a young woman forever. And I can tell you that will bring you much more happiness and bliss in the long run, because that relationship will satisfy you on all levels and in the deepest places of your soul. Powerful question. I would much prefer, prefer having a shatchan who, to tell me which girls I can date who will understand this and will accept this homosexual aspect. Okay, I don't know if those are available on that level, but perhaps I would have to do research on that. Next question. I go out on a date. I'll have very good reasons to feel that this person is not for me. I come home. My parents will push me to go out again on a date. How would you go about this? It's so hard for me. I feel it's not good. And my parents want me to go again. I don't know your relationship with your parents. If you have a very good relationship with your parents and you could be open with them, you could say, Tati, mommy, why are you pushing me? I'm really feeling resistance. Now they might say, we get it and we respect it. But maybe there's something you're not noticing. Maybe there's a weakness inside of you that you have to confront. Maybe there's a weakness inside of us that we have to confront. In other words, if the relationship is very honest, then this can be a great opportunity for profound conversation and profound growth. Because maybe your parents' point is that maybe you have blind spots. Maybe there's things you want to work on. Maybe there's traumas you want to confront. And maybe you shouldn't just be saying no. But if your relationship with your parents is much more superficial and they're just pressuring you because they want you out of the house and you're really not honest with them, then there's something you need. Then you need other people that you trust that you could talk about this with. But the fact that you're always saying you have good reasons to say no may be enough, but maybe not. So that's why it's always good to have someone we trust or people we trust, a mentor, a 
confidant, a rabbi, a mashpia, a good therapist, a professional, someone in our family who's experienced, who really gets it, that, you know, we can share our experiences, we can get feedback. And if you know that you may have blockages, and who doesn't have blockages, but the more you become aware of them, the more you can be curious and ask yourself, is there a pattern here? In other words, is my no really coming from a very subconscious place where I'm not ready to say yes to anybody? I will always find a reason to say no. And then your parents may have a very good idea. So there's different variables that you want to address here. But the clear point is that on one hand, you shouldn't feel the need to be a people's pleaser and just continue to date because you're giving into other people's pressure. You have to have confidence. You have to trust yourself. You have to believe in yourself. You have to respect yourself. If you feel this is really not for you, why are you going to waste the time of a girl or a boy next time and then next time and next time just to please your mother or your grandmother or your aunt? It doesn't make sense to me, right? So that's very important. But on the other hand, if you're feeling that authentically there may be some perspective in what they're saying, then you should ask yourself tough questions because maybe this is an opportunity for you to go to a deeper place. If we're supposed to live our lives with mayach shalat alalev, the mind ruling our heart, does our heart wanting to get married to someone mean that our mind led our heart to that feeling? If the Rebbe told Rabbi Grona that even our brain shouldn't decide if he is the one or she is the one, what does that mean? Does that mean I let my heart go wild and chaotic and my heart decides everything on its own? <laughs> Great question. The Valdike question. Very, very good question. I like that. I like that question. Gewaldik. Okay. Moyach Shalit al Halev doesn't mean the mind represses the heart. It means the mind is like a good parent. What's the job of a parent? Al Rebbe says in Peri Gimel of Tanya that the mind, Moichin, are like mothers, right? Imois, Chachma Binadas are like mothers, and Midas are like children. What's the role of a parent? The role of a parent is that if a child is crying or laughing or giggling or running around or playing, they no, 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 stop making noise. This house has to be quiet. It's not what a parent does. A parent, on the contrary, you want to help your children express themselves and have fun and be creative. And if they need to cry, they can cry. If they need to laugh, they need to laugh. The sound of children giggling and laughing and running around and being themselves is the most blissful, from the most blissful sounds in life. The job of a parent is, to, on the contrary, to help direct the child, to nurture the child, to make the child feel safe, to protect the child, to nav help the child navigate their paths in life. What does that mean practically in our own lives? The job of the brain is not to shush the heart. The job of the brain is to direct. Shalit is not a dictator. Shalit is a guide, like a parent, like a mentor, like a teacher for a student. I don't want to shut, shut down my student. I want to polish my student that he or she should shine. So practically what that means is the heart can get very, very impulsive. The heart can get very, very scared. The heart can get very, very overwhelmed. The heart can get very, very anxious. And here you have the brain that can come in. It can be there for the heart to hug it and embrace it and calm it down and talk to it and see what's going on and sometimes tell the heart, you know, stay here, mommy will come back in a few minutes, don't worry. And sometimes you have to tell the heart, come with me, come, let me give you a little ice cream. And sometimes you have to tell the heart, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. And sometimes you have to listen to the heart who's actually telling you the truth. Say, oh my God, wow, this is true. Your child is aware of a danger. Your child is smelling smoke. Your child is smelling smoke. Call the fire department. That's why we need a responsible parent who's not afraid of the heart. And I believe that's how I understand it. What the Rebbe was telling Rabbi Groner is, the brain can't decide these things means I can't have a relationship only for my brain because it makes sense that this young woman is for me. Great, but that's not a marriage. Your heart needs to get excited. There's a feeling, there's love, there's intensity, there's passion, there's distractions. Of course we use our brains. Of course we use our brains. I can get impulsive. I can be an addict. I can do Michigan. My heart can have all types of cravings that are very, very unhealthy. <laughs> so you need your brain to be able to see what type of emotion it is, where it's coming from. Is it coming from brokenness? Is it coming from wholeness? Is it coming from fear? Is it coming from creativity? Is it coming from my core self? Is it coming from my external self? That's where the brain comes in. 
But the job of the brain is not to live life for the heart. The job of the brain is to help the heart beat to the, its profoundest and most exciting beat. Got it? Next question, when can you say to a person that's been married before and divorced and hardly gets calls for shidduch suggestions? What are you going to tell them? They keep on davening and hoping, but they feel extremely discouraged. You're dealing with a great person, has many qualities, but they feel that for some reason there is a xeri, there's a decree on them. What would you say to encourage them? This person has been married before. They're not getting any calls for shidduch suggestions. Mm, wow. First of all, I would say that I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's hard and it's painful, and I'm very sorry. Number one. Number two, I would say I would not define something as Xavier if we don't know that it's Xavier. I would not say that. I don't think we have that capability or authority to be able to say there's a decree on me or on this person, chas v'shalom. What I would suggest is that despite the fact that there are no calls at the moment, do not internalize a sense of rejection. Do not look in the mirror and say, God hates me. My life is over. There's a decree on me for me to be miserable, for me to never be married. How do we know? How do you know? Rather, I would try to do something else. Feel the pain. And if you have to cry, cry. And if you need to speak to the right people, speak to the right people. It's important for you to have an emotional support system to vent, to express yourself. But don't try to come up with conclusions and define the reality and story of your life in intellectual terms. And let me, let me, let me clarify what I mean because I feel many of us make this mistake. We have been trained to use our brains a little too much. We try to understand our life. We try to come to conclusions based on intellectual calculations. It's absurd. It's ridiculous. You can't live life with your brain as much as you cannot eat a piece of cake with your brain. You want to eat, you need to use your mouth and you cannot watch a beautiful film or look at a beautiful piece of art with your ears and you can't listen to music with your eyes life you can't experience with your brain life we have to experience with our soul with our heart with our emotions our brains are there to understand those things that we need to understand and to help bring awareness to those things that we need to bring awareness to but to understand the full picture why things are happening how things are happening what does this mean what's the future I don't understand. I don't have to understand. When we use our brain to understand the story, the narrative of our lives, we do one of two things. Either we force the story into intellectual constructs that is an absurd attempt because it's beyond our mind, or we simply become so frustrated and, 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 and almost it could be meshugged because it's not fitting in. So either we force it in or we get frustrated and overwhelmed. What if we don't have to? <laughs> what if I can open myself up to the fact that there are things in my life that are painful? I don't know why. I don't have to know why. I don't need to understand the journey of my soul. My soul is l'may 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 Hashem is l'may l'may and I just want to be a channel for the truth to come through me so you can feel the pain. You can let your mind go, let it go. Unburden it of its egotistical need to wrap its brain around reality. Let the mind be free. Let it be untied. Let it be unbound. Let the mind experience the bliss of intimacy with your creator. You'll be surprised how powerful that is. That's how I would approach it. Then you know what happens? You open yourself up to new opportunities that you never imagined because you couldn't imagine them in your brain, but your soul can imagine them because the soul is rooted in a muna, which is infinite. Is it possible to mess up a shidduch by saying the wrong thing to somebody? I feel like I messed up a very good option by being too open too quickly. 
these things nobody knows. Can we mess up things? Ultimately, people are always, always doing a shamanu for the wrong thing. One person is being remorseful forever because I said too much. The other one is being remorseful because I said too little. If things would have worked out a different way, we also may have been remorseful. I'll tell you, with these things, it's very, very hard to know how divine providence orchestrates life. But the bottom line is, if something happened, this was the journey of our soul. Should you learn lessons from it? Yeah. Sometimes I say something, and then afterwards I tell myself, you know what, before you say something, be so careful. Sometimes I say things in a class, I'm maybe a little too open, or I wasn't thinking, or I was just a little impulsive, and then I tell myself, you know, before you open your mouth and speak, you need to be very cautious and careful. It's a good lesson. It's a good lesson. I don't mean to inhibit yourself and speak in a way that's, you know, so calculated that you're not real, but I mean, just be considerate with of who's sitting there and what people are sensitive to, etc. So we could learn lessons from it, but I would not wallow in a play in a in a in a space of endless remorse that you ruined the shidduch i don't know that you have that power with all due respect what would you suggest i do if my mom is pressuring me to tell her everything that happens on a date i don't want to tell my mother everything that's happening <laughs> on a <the> date <laughs> You want me to come in between a Jewish boy and his mother? Come on. <laughs> uh, listen, I don't know about your relationship with your mother, so it's very hard for me to give advice. So let's assume that your relationship is not a perfect relationship, but it's somewhat honest and good and warm and loving. So then you should have an honest conversation with your mother and say, listen, it's not so easy for me to talk to you. And I have other people that I'm more open with. And I think a good mother can understand that. You know, our children need sometimes people to talk to who are not their parents. Because with parents, it's very tough. We're entangled with our parents. We're enmeshed with our parents. We either love them <laughs> or the opposite. We either admire them or the opposite. We either have so many positive feelings or the opposite or a challenge. And sometimes you feel your parents don't get you, or your parents don't trust you, your parents don't respect you, or your parents have too much of their own pain, or your parents are not worked out people, or your parents impose all their stuff on you. I don't know. And you maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong, maybe you're 50% right. But the bottom line is it's good to have people outside of your parents with whom to speak. And perhaps you can explain this to your mother. You know, you could tell your mother, say, I'm happy to share some things, but not everything. If your mother cannot accept that at all, it's like you are not allowed to not share something with her it's a little suspicious to me you know even in a marriage of 30 40 years if a spouse tells a spouse it's not something i'm ready to share we have to respect each other so i don't see that as a reason that because your mother wants you to share everything you have to share everything that's not kibbudeim it's it's your life you don't have to share everything about your life and i think it's important for your mother to respect it and for you to have that open conversation with her if there's something else going on which means <clears throat> The relationship with your mother is a very, very flawed and difficult and challenging relationship, and your mother keeps on triggering you. So then, obviously, you can't share these things with her because, yeah, your relationship is not good, but maybe at some point I would encourage you to work on your relationship with your mother. That may be helpful. In fact, that may even be helpful for your dating with your girl. So that's maybe a good idea. If your mother is open to it and you're open to it, it may be a good thing to work on your relationship, and there's a lot of help out there today. What's a tactful way to ask about a man's financial obligations to his kids? What's my role in paying for his kids? What's my role in paying for the weddings of his children? It's joint income. I unwillingly became the ATM machine. I want to avoid that again in my next marriage. What's your opinion about prenups? Financial and for a get, chas v'shalom. Okay, great question. And I think the right way of talking about financial obligations is in a very respectful and kind and tyridica way with edelkeit and refinement, not in a greedy way, not in a narcissistic way on both sides, but rather in a very respectful way. You know, what are our plans? What are our obligations? I cannot give you detailed advice because I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an arbitrator, and I'm not a paisik. 
So therefore, I do not get involved in family arbitration. I'm simply not an expert in any of these areas. In other words, who's responsible for the expenses of the other person's children when there's a second marriage? Are you responsible for weddings of the other children? I, uh, I'm simply not familiar with the ins and outs of this, but I am sure that there are people who are doing this professionally, and I would perhaps get their advice. Maybe there are even websites or books about this that were written and really get advice. And if you're dating a mensch, to be able to work it out in a menschlicha, in a very, very menschlicha way. And I think that's really the key. As a kid, I'm going to say this. I have watched two couples who got divorced. Both had children. One couple got divorced because of a terrible, terrible story, a devastating story. It was the husband's fault. You know, no question about it. The husband knows it. He was an addict. He did some immoral things. His marriage was destroyed. He went into recovery. But I watched one thing. The husband and the wife, the first husband, the first wife, mentioned. They were mentioned. They were civil. They knew that they don't want to destroy three kids just because they had a fallout and just because there were not good things happen. And throughout the entire divorce, Despite many, many disagreements, I could just see that they had their brains intact. Their heads were screwed on straight. They realized you don't turn your children into missiles against your ex just because you may have issues with your ex for sure. And you may loathe your ex and you may detest your ex and you may hate your ex and you may wish your ex dropped dead a hundred thousand times because of what he did or because of what she did. You're right or wrong is a separate issue, but you're going to take three children and turn them into missiles. For these children, she's their mother. For these children, he's their father. Do you really think it's going to be the psychological and emotional benefit of the children that your ex becomes the enemy of their your children as well so they don't have a mother anymore, they don't have a father anymore? I'm not talking about a case where father and mother are outrightly physically or emotionally abusive, where they beat their kids or they molested their kids and they have to be protected. But I'm talking about a case where there are a lot of personality issues and there are a lot of struggles and you really don't like your ex, but you don't think that your ex is a dangerous man who's, who's, uh, who's physically or sexually abusing your children or emotionally abusing them. You just don't like your ex. I watched this couple and I was in awe because I knew how many challenges they had with each other, but they always made sure to communicate in a way that would benefit their children. There was a story not long. It was a crazy story. So a mitzvah, a boy got a, had a bar mitzvah, and his father made a big bar mitzvah because he came from a bro. His parents are divorced, and this was the opportunity of the father to, you know, splurge on his son and show him some love, perhaps. And he invited the whole town to the bar mitzvah. Well, you know what happened? The mother decided to take revenge from her ex, and she didn't let her son show up to the bar mitzvah. I was invited to go to the bar mitzvah. They called me and said, Sir Achmanis, the guy, the father is there and the boy never showed up. Now I ask you a question. I don't know the details. I don't know the father. I don't know the mother. But imagine she did not allow her son to go to his bar mitzvah to take revenge from her ex. And it happens both ways. So it's very, very important. Menschlichkeit, menschlichkeit, menschlichkeit. And this brings us to the issue of prenups. I'm not a halachic authority to be able to give a uh, decisive opinion about the halachic validity of prenups. I know that in different communities, there's different approaches. But one thing is certain. There are so many people suffering because a husband or a wife are refusing to give or take a get. And sometimes the abuse in that area is horrendous, horrendous. I have in my own community two people, a woman whose husband refused to give her a get for 15 years, and another man who's refusing to give his wife a get for many, many years. And I thought I'll be able to convince and persuade. I thought with my gift of gab, perhaps, with God's grace, I'll be able to persuade this man to give his wife a get to no avail. The level of stubbornness and trauma that he lives with is so, so profound that he would rather destroy his own future. None of his children talk to him. None of his eight children talk to him. Isn't that a good sign that it's time to give, but he won't give his wife a get? And he says that he's doing God's will. <laughs> you understand? It's so important that whatever happens in a marriage, or God forbid, after a marriage, menschlichkeit, humanness, 
sensitivity, menschlichkeit, be a man, don't abuse, don't persecute, don't use children against your spouse, don't schlep people through the ringer and torture them just because there is a physical vendetta and this pain, so, so important. In terms of prenups, I would say, and I can't speak as Allah authority, I'm not, but generally because of the amount of problems, anything that can be done before a marriage to avoid these potential pitfalls should be done because unfortunately many people are suffering many people are suffering and our community did not respond the way we should have when there's an aguna the whole community should be there for her and the other way as well i don't mean to say that only women are guilty and all men are rishayim and all women are tzaddikim. sometimes it's the other way as well there are women who could be very, very sick and very, very traumatized and behave in very, very not good ways, and the men are suffering. I'm not naive. I don't think just because you're a woman, you're a tzaddik, a tzaddik, and when you're a man, you're wicked. That's not true. <laughs> there are some men who are tzaddikim, and there are some women who are big, big tzaddikim, and they're suffering a lot. But the community needs to be very, very attentive. A guy who's refusing to give his wife a get, or a woman is refusing to take a get from her husband, and you could see that good, normal, moral rabbis are all encouraging the get, but it's not happening. We shouldn't support such a person. Such a person should be hunted down on every, on every possible way. They should not be getting respect from the community and people smiling to them on Shabbos because you want to be good with everybody. At whose expense? At a woman who's suffering as an aguna for 15 years, for 20 years, for 10 years, so that you could smile to this person on Shabbos, when this person is behaving in a despicable way, torturing a Jewish woman or torturing a man. I love the part of the lecture when you spoke about that we have to appreciate the journey and the mysteries of our unique soul's journey, even while we're dating and even before we're married. But I have a question. How should I deal with the fear, with the anxiety? I may never find my shidduch. I'll have to date for endless years. How should I deal with the loneliness? I am single. Very powerful question. It's very late, so I'm going to now give very short answers to this. It's a very, very powerful question. And all I could say to you is, don't try to wrap your brain around your future and figure out your future. And don't allow fear to overwhelm the story of your life. Be open to the mystery, but do every morning anchor yourself in a space of infinite love and truth. Spend time with your nefesh ali kiss. Spend time with your chelik elikami ma'al mamish. Make it your best friend. It has so much confidence and so much clarity. And even though you're single, you have infinite value. And you can create very powerful and deep relationships as a single person. First of all, with yourself. Second of all, with God. And then automatically with other people. Don't try to figure out the rest of the story. And there's no need to allow fear to dictate our lives. Yeah, we all have fear. But fear is a thought. You are not the fear. How do I know? Because you can observe the fear inside of you. So watch the fear and say, wow, I'm so sorry that this is what you're feeling and I'm here for you, but I am not my fear. Don't make decisions from a place of fear and anxiety. You are not the anxiety. The anxiety is inside of you. What message can you give to people who are 30 and up and never got married? They're not getting any suggestions. They're not young anymore. Is there any state or obligation for a shatchan to find a shidduch for older people? Or no. Ignore them and let people focus on those in their 20s. Every one of us has a mitzvah of a including shatchanim. So whenever we can be of help to anybody, we should be of help. And this is a very important moment to reach out to everybody and say, Keep your eyes open. You never know who you see, who you meet at a Shabbos table, in a supermarket, in a shul, at a friend's house, at an event, at a class. Be open because maybe something will come up and you can be a tremendous ambassador of kindness and love and help somebody find a shidduch. That's number one. Number two, as I said earlier, every person deserves to have a support system. I know it's not comfortable. But whatever age you are, find people that you trust. Maybe uncles, maybe aunts, maybe brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces, siblings, friends, classmates, and say, you know what, this is my situation. I need a support system. I need 20, 30 people who have my back and are looking for me. And you, you, it's, it's a great way, but there are that maybe things can happen with Hashem's help. So it's vulnerable to do like, you know, you feel needy, but you're not, you're not needy. You're a person who wants to get married. And yes, 
you're searching for people who can be of support to you and be here for you. And I think it's very important for Shatchanim not to abandon this demographic. Chas v'shalom, chas v'shalom. And what I say to you is, number one, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's very, very hard. I have no magic potions or magic medicines to assuage your pain and anxiety. But again, I'm going to say that the last thing you want to do is give up on yourself. The last thing you want to do is reach intellectual conclusions about your worthiness or lack of worthiness, dignity or lack of dignity. There is a mystery in the journeys of life. And you want to open yourself up to that mystery without the need to understand and comprehend and control. And every day anchor yourself in a space of infinite oneness and love. Anchor yourself in a space where you are divine sacred, unsoiled, untarnished, and operate from that space. Can you speak about the pain of navigating? Can you speak about navigating the pain of a younger sibling getting engaged first? How can I be sensitive to them? But how can I be sensitive to myself? So many hard emotions come up. Great, great question. Great, great question. Very, very important. You need to have somebody that you speak to very openly about all the pain. Again, someone you trust, a confidant, a therapist, a trauma therapist, a rabbi, a rebbitzin, somebody who's experienced with life, somebody with whom you can be very open about how difficult it is, how painful it is. When you can create space for the pain of this disappointment, you'll also be able to rejoice with your sibling genuinely. In other words, it's not either or. It's not like, oh, I'm having so much pain, I'm probably not happy for my sibling, which means I'm a faker, which means I'm coming to the wedding, but I'm really hating every moment of it. It's not either or. You're a human being. You have emotions. You wanted to get married first. You're not. You need to grieve for the disappointment, and you need somebody to grieve with you. You need somebody to help you process your emotions. And it doesn't take away from the fact that you're also a good sibling, and you want your brother and sister to be happy. And both are true. You have pain, and you have to honor that pain. And you have joy, and you have to honor that joy. And it doesn't mean that you're a bad person, and you're not a tzaddik, and you're a rasha because you're feeling pain while your brother and sister are having a beautiful echayim or a beautiful wedding and a beautiful joy. You're not a bad person. You're a human being. And you have to grieve because your life took on a different journey. You didn't expect this five, ten years ago. Give yourself that dignity. Give yourself that respect. And it doesn't take away from the fact that another part of you is celebrating your sibling success. And you are genuinely at the wedding happy. You're not miserable at the wedding. You don't want your brother and sister to have a miserable life. You want them to have a very happy life. But you're in pain. And don't confuse the two. And don't call yourself disingenuine. Is it appropriate to push a potential partner to take on more religiously more religious observance, even when they aren't ready to take on more. I would be very careful with that because, because you don't want them to resent you for that. And every time they feel the responsibility and the obligation and the pressure they feel, you're guilty. These things have to come from a very internal space. Should you tell someone about a health condition on the first date or wait? I don't know of the first date. I heard from Reb David Kayan. He's a very, very big Paisik in the, in the from world, especially in the Litvish world. He's Rav of Gvulyaivitz. Rav David, Kay, Rav David Kay and Shlita, and I heard him speak at a Nefesh conference, and he spoke about the third or fourth date, the third or fourth date, where there is enough trust and enough of a relationship that they won't say no right away because they, they know enough about you to say, you know what, I'm ready to deal with this. But yet, it's not so far down the dating process that you know that they're completely consumed by you and this is just going to cause unnecessary heartbreak. And that was his piece of advice. May Hashem give each and every one of you bracha v'atzlacha ad blidai to find what you're searching for. And may you all be able to share with all us psuris taivis tamid kal hayamim. May you find the inner serenity, tranquility, simcha sachayim, confidence, joy, emunah betachen, to be able to live life to the fullest to maximize your potential, to realize how infinitely precious your souls are, to be able to navigate every day of life with your enthusiasm, with your full presence, with your full beauty, with your full spiritual and physical splendor. And may Hashem guide you in the right way to be able to make the right decisions and to be able to, may, you, may He fulfill all of your heart's desires, including the desire of many of you to build beautiful homes. May we see the Dan a complete victory and a complete redemption 
Takeuf Umayyad Mamish. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi Jacobson, for your very inspiring, uplifting words. And thank you, everyone, for joining. We should celebrate. Uh, we should hear many, many mazel tavs, and everyone who is still on their journey and searching should have an easy journey, and Bezat Hashem, we should hear many mazel tavs, the Karag Mamish. Thank you, everyone, for joining. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.